I stopped recording. Good morning. I'm Christy Nicolo, and thank you for joining us for our Saturday morning webinar series. I'm filling in for Alan this morning, and we'll be speaking about understanding spousal lifetime access trusts or spousal limited access trusts, and whatever we want to call them, they're usually known as SLATs. And today we're going to talk about them from basic to some nuances that are present when designing and drafting these types of trust vehicles. And on slide number two, we have instructions for those of you who want to get CPE credit for today's presentation. It can qualify for up to one CPE credit by following the instructions here on slide number two. It's very similar to what has occurred in the past. For those of you who are repeat listeners that have, uh, have enjoyed our presentations in the past to, to suffer through this one with me, uh, and and I will try my best to live up to Alan's trademark dry humor. I will promise you that I won't come close, but let's see if we can make this enjoyable. Uh, I want to tell you that if you register through our law firm's email, you will not be receiving CPE credit. This is not the way to get CPE credit. That's why we have this big red wrong here on the left side. Uh, so please be aware of how you register for the webinar, depending on your desires for CPE credit. All right, so as we typically do, we, we go through a lot of housekeeping matters up front. How do we ask a question? Well, there are questions that can be asked on the right side of, of the GoToMeeting uh, or GoToWebinar uh, system. It's very straightforward, type a question. I'll do my best to answer it. If I can't get to you while I'm speaking, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is on almost every page little peek behind the curtain here. We stole this housekeeping slides from a past presentation that Alan Gassman and Brandon Ketron have, been, have given. But on the first page of the, of the deck and on every substantive page, my email address is. So please feel free to email me with any questions. You're also welcome to email Alan or Brandon with the difficult questions uh, if you prefer. And as many of you know, we have a, an extensive library of Saturday webinars here on YouTube. If you go to Alan Gassman's YouTube uh, webinar, you can please join the movement, get Alan's YouTube uh, subscription numbers way up to, to the point where we can focus on YouTube and not law practice. I doubt that the interest in this area will ever garner that much support, but we appreciate your support and we welcome you to, to get us to, uh, to look at our, our library of, of past webinars, should you be interested. And then of course, our Thursday report, please do feel free to subscribe to our Thursday report by emailing us at info at gasmanpa.com. It comes out on some Thursdays. It used to come out on every Thursday, but it, it's really well done. We, we like to put a lot of thought and effort into these articles and we like to be timely. Uh, you'll see that the one of these here that I had so happened to work on extensively from a few weeks back is, is our sample. And if you like any of these topics or many more, I, I encourage you to take a look at it. The jokes aren't bad either. They're not nearly as good as Alan's Saturday morning jokes, but they're pretty dang good in a lot of instances. So please do subscribe if this is of interest to you. And of course, just a few other webinars that we have in the queue, a uh, practical planner webinar with Alan and Marty Shankman. Always a great dynamite presentation when the two of them get together. So I encourage you to, to look at that as well. And then here we have our menu of the month of May and going into June, our Saturday webinars. You have me this week, unfortunately. Next week, you have Alan coming back. For those of you who, who miss him, uh, he'll be here on June 3rd. And then going into June, we have a chock full of Alan all the way through the 17th. And stay tuned for updates as we get beyond uh, June 17th into June 24th and, and so forth. And of course, Alan's books, Eight Steps to a Proper Florida Trust and Estate Plan. Uh, you're welcome to, to purchase that by clicking on the link here in the PowerPoint deck, and we certainly appreciate your support. Now, with all that housekeeping behind us, let's get down to brass tacks, a SLAT. So the word SLAT means either a spousal limited access trust or a spousal lifetime access trust. They generally mean the same thing, right? They really are mean the same thing. Put very plainly, it's an irrevocable trust created by one spouse for the benefit of the of another spouse and potentially descendants or other beneficiaries where the beneficiary spouse can receive distributions during his or her lifetime based upon a limited distribution standard 
In most states, the trust will not be subject to creditor claims, even if the spouse is the beneficiary spouse, that is, is a trustee of the trust. In, I believe, every state, it's not subject to most creditor claims of the, the beneficiaries. We will get into jurisdiction selection later on and how creditor planning uh, can, can address that. But by and large, the beneficiaries, creditors cannot reach into the trust assets uh, in most cases. The trust also is outside of the estate tax system of the beneficiaries of the trust, the grantor of the trust, um, for as long as the assets remain in the trust, which in most states is what I like to call forever. Florida, it's a thousand years, which is almost akin to forever when it comes to thinking about asset planning, given that a thousand years ago, the world looked quite a bit different than it did today. And I can only imagine how it will look in the year 3023. So a SLAT is really a great creditor protection and estate planning tool, but it has to be properly drafted, funded, and administered. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how to draft, design, administer these SLATs so that you can get the best out of them. Because if you don't, then there can be traps for the unwary that can cause unwanted estate tax, unwanted uh, creditor protection implications. Uh, so it's very important to make to make uh, yourself aware of, of these issues that potentially could occur when drafting the trust. Now, on today's talk, I'm going to be using quite a few terms of art. And rather than explain them every single time I use them, uh, that I think it's best to just go over the terms here at the, at the go. And the slat, we already covered that. The grantor spouse or the settlor spouse is the spouse who establishes the trust. That's the spouse who sets up the trust for the beneficiaries of the trust. The beneficiary spouse, you guessed it, is the beneficiary of the trust. So I set up a slat for my wife, Sophia. Sophia benefits from that trust. She is the beneficiary spouse. I am the grantor, I am the grantor spouse. Now, there is also an option called a floating spouse, and it has nothing to do with levitation or flying or anything of that nature. A floating spouse is a trust provision that basically says whoever the spouse is married to at the grantor spouse is married to at any given time, that is the grantor spouse, that's the beneficiary spouse for the purposes of the trust instrument. And a lot of wealthy clients who maybe are on second marriages or who are not yet married but might be married in the near future implement this floating spouse provision because it provides for flexibility. And we'll get into that as we get more down to the nuances applicable to these trusts. A grantor trust. Well, the trust is usually going to be a grantor trust, meaning that the grantor is considered to be the owner of the trust for federal income tax purposes. Very simply, that means all income and deductions of the trust go on to the grantor's personal tax return. It, it sounds a little onerous at first, thinking, why would anyone ever do that? Well, Two reasons, really. Number one, it allows the grantor to subsidize the activities of the trust by paying the trust's taxes. So the trust activities and investments can grow on a tax free basis. It also allows for the grantor to engage in estate planning transactions with the trust on an income tax free basis. So it's very helpful and very important to understand that concept. Most SLATs are grantor trusts. A 678 trust is a type of grantor trust, except that instead of the grantor being considered as the owner, it's a beneficiary of the trust who is considered to be the owner uh, for federal income tax purposes and for most state income tax purposes. So that, that's a, a unique type of trust. Most slats, again, are grantor trusts as to the grantor during the grantor's lifetime. So a 678 trust is not as applicable in this context. We also may talk about community property, which is property acquired by a spouse or a couple when they reside in the community property state. Uh, this, these assets must be transmuted to non-community property before they can be uh, transferred to a slat in most circumstances. And then finally, gift splitting. So gift splitting is a, a form of, of gifting where a grantor makes a gift and the spouse, the other spouse, uh, despite not having any ownership in the assets gifted, 
is deemed under the Internal Revenue Code to have made a gift of one half of those assets. Here's a real simple example. I own 100 shares of 3M stock. I gift the 3M stock to a trust for my descendants only. Sophia, my spouse, decides that she's going to split that gift. Well, for tax purposes, it's considered as if I gifted equivalent value to 50 shares of 3M stock and Sophia gifted equivalent value to, three, uh, to 50 shares of 3M stock. And there are some nuances here when it comes to gifting to a slat that involves gift splitting. And we can talk about that as we get down the slide deck a little bit further. All right, so just a real brief interaction on uh, the income tax operation of each type of trust. As I said, a slat is mostly going to be a grantor trust, just really because the, grant, the grantor's spouse being a beneficiary, that in and of itself usually causes the trust to be a grantor trust for federal income tax purposes. Here's some refresher on the other types of trusts that can own inc that can uh, uh, be treated differently for federal income tax purposes. There's complex trust, uh, which is the trust that pays its own taxes, and so forth here. And this is important if you have S corporation stock that's being transferred to a trust. Um, you want to make sure that the trust can be an eligible S corporation shareholder. Now, of course, a grantor trust is a type of trust that is an S corporation shareholder or can be an S corporation shareholder without jeopardizing the S corporation's uh, election. Um, but you know, we like to make elections to treat these trusts as ESBITs or electing small business trusts as belt and suspenders to make certain that the S corporation election of the trust is not jeopardized uh, if the trust will be funded with S corporation stock. Okay, so after catching my breath there, let's get down to the ingredients of a slat. By definition, you have to have a grantor who's married or who may be married. Certainly, a grantor can form, form a trust for descendants or siblings or friends, but that's not a slat by definition. And the importance of the slat or, or the reason why a slat is so useful for a lot of married couples is that it allows the grantor to fund a trust for his or her spouse to make use of the grantor's lifetime gifting exclusion before it sunsets in 2026. And by making this gift, it essentially allows the assets to be used for the benefit of the other spouse during the other spouse's lifetime so that the assets aren't really given away from the married couple. It, it, it effectively allows the assets to be used for the benefit of another spouse while making use of lifetime gifting exclusion. And this is important because the present lifetime gifting exclusion is $12,920,000 per person less prior tax and taxable gifts. Three years from now, or just under three years from now, in 2026, that number drops down to approximately $7,500,000 less prior taxable gifts. And a lot of wealthy clients, a lot of wealthy married couples are going to lose that approximately five million or so delta in estate tax exclusion that will be gone potentially forever. Now, I, I do not have a crystal ball. I cannot tell you what the estate tax law will be in the year of the death of your clients or even in the year 2026 or beyond. It, it's permanent until Congress changes it again. And we could see enormously high exemptions where we don't have to worry about this loss of exemption. Or we could see an exemption dropping down to the three and a half million per person or five million per person levels that were teased in the last couple of years when. The Build Back Better Act and the Bernie Sanders plan were rolled out. Uh, those have not become law, and there have not been a lot of murmurs about dropping the exemption to those levels. But the idea is we have this large exemption. Let's use it for wealthy clients before we lose it. And one way to do so is placing assets into a slat either by gift or by installment sale. And we'll talk about how that works in just a second. Of course, you have to have a spouse or a potential future spouse as a beneficiary. And you can include any other beneficiary except for the grantor. If the grantor is a beneficiary of the slat, uh, in a lot of instances, that's going to jeopardize the estate tax and creditor protection of the slat. Although in some states, it's 
seems to be fine to have the grantor as a beneficiary of the trust. And we'll talk about that once we get to those states uh, in, in asset jurisdiction or asset protection jurisdiction situs as a topic here for us to discuss. And <clears throat> moving along, it looks like I got ahead of my skis there. You know, there are about 30 or so asset protection, uh, juris non asset protection jurisdictions where the grantor can't safely be a beneficiary, but about a dozen or so. Uh, jurisdictions provide that a grantor can be a beneficiary of a SLAT and have that or, or, or have that trust uh, protected from the grantor's creditors. There are different rules in each state, so I, I urge you to uh, be aware of those potential differences. You know, Florida, for example, is a state where we we have a, a SLAT friendly uh, or an irrevocable trust friendly statute where the grantor spouse can be a beneficiary only after the beneficiary spouse's death, but that's not a true asset protection jurisdiction. Uh, there's places like Nevada, Delaware, and South Dakota that have a stronger statute where the, the grantor's creditors can't reach into a trust for the benefit of the grantor if the grantor um, you know, is, is funded it and is a beneficiary of the trust. Um, there is some caution to be had with those trusts because nobody knows how a Florida judge giving a Florida judgment uh, over Florida assets in a South Dakota slat, if that will allow the assets of the slat to be protected from the grantor's creditors if the grantor is a beneficiary. For that reason, we consider the Offshore Asset Protection Trust, which you know is outside the auspices of the United States Constitution and potential application of the full faith and credit clause. So. Just a few words of wisdom there when we think about these slats. Now, if you do go offshore, you know, keep in mind there are some heightened filing requirements that have to apply with respect to these types of trusts, a Form 3520 each year, a 3520A each year thereafter, potentially FBAR forms. It's important to engage a CPA firm that knows what to do with offshore tax reporting because the penalties can be draconian. They can be substantial as a percentage of the trust assets. And if you're the planner who sets these up, you best believe that they're gonna come looking for you if there is a large penalty as a result of not complying with these heightened requirements. Uh, the trust offshore, of course, will be generally a grantor trust. And don't put S-Corp stock in those types of trusts because you, you won't have an eligible S-Corporation shareholder, notwithstanding that the trust is a grantor trust. A lot of our slats have these these provisions here where we typically have a flea clause where the grantor um could cause or excuse me the trustee could cause the the trust situs to go to a different jurisdiction if and when there is a uh a, a judgment against the the trust now or judgment against the the uh, grantor and potentially being satisfied against trust assets now i will tell you that some clients have creditor issues when they come into your office and setting up a slat or an irrevocable trust and funding said trust with assets uh, at that time could lead to fraudulent transfer concerns and can substantially undermine the efficacy of the trust. Well, we have something like a Jones clause here where you can kind of carve out uh, a creditor who can, can uh, have their judgment satisfied from trust assets so that the slat can be bound against potential future creditors. Now, we talked earlier about having the grantor as a beneficiary of a domestic asset protection trust. Our law firm ten, tends to set these trusts up as hybrid asset protection trusts where trust protectors can't add back the grantor as a beneficiary of the trust unless or until the grantor or the grantor's spouse um, has filed a petition for divorce or maybe there's a situation where the grantor's assets have dropped below an independently significant number, like a million dollars in this case, uh, where that way if the grantor's net worth drops below that independently significant number, they can be added as a beneficiary of the trust so that the trust is a source of last resort for the grantor. But if the grantor has a net worth of $20 million, the likelihood of this provision ever being implicated is low. And that way, the, the grantor has some comfort that the trust can be there as a safety net. But at the same time, we also have assurances that 
you know, a creditor can't come along or the IRS can't come along and say, well, look, you can willy nilly add the grantor back to this trust. It's almost as if he's a, he's a beneficiary or she's a beneficiary. So we're going to treat him as a beneficiary for tax purposes or for asset protection planning purposes. So a, a really neat trick to use here. Now, a lot of slats, as I said, we engage in installment sale transactions where assets can be funded into an LLC. Uh, Non-voting interest in the LLC can be sold from a client to the spousal beneficiary trust in exchange for a promissory note. And the assets in the, in the trust you know, are essentially grow at, an, at, a, at a level higher than this <laughs> seem to be fictional rate of 1.35% annual interest. But when we did this plan a couple of years ago, this was the interest rate in place. So the growth under the LLC held by this trust would then escape the estate tax system and the value would then be frozen in the client's estate at about $7 million. So a really neat little technique that still has some efficacy given that, you know, even though that you have these higher interest rates in place, the fact that you can have assets that grow at a higher level is important to understand. Uh, you know, that this is a, a great technique to, that can be used and potentially down the road, the technique could be, uh, could, could allow the client to forgive the promissory note because forgiving the promissory note can make use of this exemption level that we talked about just a few minutes ago. So it's important to, to assure that we understand uh, that this installment sale technique has some efficacy uh, in, a, in a situation where the client is not sure if they want to make a gift at this point but later can come back and forgive the note or gift assets to the trust later on that can be used to repay the note. So an, an important technique that we tend to use quite often. So uh, when it comes to designing these slats and, and using them for receptacles of estate planning transactions, whether it be gifts or installment sales, keep in mind some of these considerations. So the settlor spouse can be the trustee of the trust, in which case, the trust will be treated as a grantor trust for income tax purposes. We typically draft to have the grantor spouse, the beneficiary spouse, have the ability to receive distributions reasonably needed for health, education, maintenance, and support. Okay, that's a very important standard because that standard allows the assets in the trust uh, to not be included in the estate of the grantor spouse once the, um, the trust is funded. And in most states, it allows the, the, the beneficiary spouse to be a beneficiary of the trust and receive distributions from the trust uh, in a manner uh, that doesn't cause the, her, his or her creditors to affect, to reach the trust. We also consider having general powers of appointment in place, or excuse me, a general power of appointment marital trust in place if the trust is funded and we're worried about gift tax concerns. That's a very important you know, overflow call clause that can be used if we want to make sure that the there's no gift taxes on funding. It's it's a very useful tool. Now, I will say that this has not been used in the past, or excuse me, blessed by the IRS in the past, but we've used it quite a bit and we haven't had any feedback to the contrary. Uh, we haven't seen any cases where the IRS has shot down this type of marital overflow savings clause. Avoiding the reciprocal trust doctrine is a pretty big trap for the unweary. The reciprocal trust doctrine is a doctrine by the IRS that says, if I set up a slat for Sophia and she sets up one up for me, you know, the, the IRS is going to come along and try to uncross those trusts so that I will be deemed to having set up my trust and vice versa for Sophia. And by doing it that way, it, you know, it, it, you have this risk of a state tax inclusion where you otherwise thought that it would not occur. And I would strongly recommend not having a reciprocal trust in place. In fact, previous slide here, we show one client setting up the, the trust for the, the slat for the benefit of the beneficiary spouse and descendants, and the other spouse sets up the trust for the benefit of descendants only, so as to avoid application of the reciprocal trust doctrine. Uh, we also want to make sure that you know if, if we have assets that were jointly owned, by both spouses, let's split that up. Let's make sure that, you know, if the beneficiary spouse has ownership interests in assets, which is very common here in Florida as tenants by the entirety's ownership, 
don't transfer those assets to the trust because a beneficiary spouse who is a deemed contributor to that trust could cause inclusion in that spouse's estate and also adverse creditor protection implications. So very important to make sure that each the assets that go into the slot come only from the grantor spouse. Another question is whether the surviving spouse should be given a limited power of appointment, you know, the power to direct assets on death, to direct how the assets will pass. Uh, very important to have that flexibility. Some clients don't want that flexibility, but I'd say we use it about 99% of the time when we draft our slats. Should there be a divorce clause? And divorce is the 900 pound gorilla in the room that needs to be addressed when you set up these slats. Because you know we represent generally married couples most of the time, both the grantor spouse and the beneficiary spouse. And as planners, it's important to help assure that we can tell our clients, here are the implications of setting up this trust. If the grantor spouse sets this trust up, she's not going to be able to reach these assets in the event of a divorce. Whereas the beneficiary spouse may have rights and there may be a situation where the grantor spouse is paying income taxes on a trust for the beneficiary spouse, much to her chagrin, after a divorce. And that is a, a very important trap for the unweary. As a planner, I think it's appropriate to address and disclose these risk factors to clients so that they can make these decisions on how to draft and design these trusts. Now also, if the trust provides for that HEMS distribution standard, health, education, maintenance, and support, or payments to descendants, we have to make, make sure language is in the trust to protect against support claims so that creditors can't reach into the trust and access assets. So as I teased just a minute ago, who is the client, right? That's an important component of, of this. Who is the client of the trust, of, of, the, of the planner? You have to make sure that we, we disclose that. Is there going to be a floating spouse provision? So that if one spouse, if the beneficiary spouse and the grantor spouse divorce, you know, maybe the grantor spouse wants to cause the beneficiary spouse to be eliminated as a beneficiary. Uh, we have that language in some of our some of our slats, and we've done this before. Uh, we also have a potential marital agreement on the side, so that the the you know a new spouse or a beneficiary spouse agrees to reduce their entitlement as the trust assets if their divorce occurs or if certain other actions occur. Uh, you know, another solution on divorce is dividing the trust assets, one half for the benefit of the descendants of the grantor and the other half for the, the spouse. Uh, maybe we give the grantor spouse and the descendant, the, the beneficiary spouse, the ability to change the trusteeship as to their separate halves. And, and maybe we utilize trust protectors to have the ability to change the provisions of the trust should circumstances change. We, we use trust protectors in almost all of our trusts. It's very important to have that flexibility, we think. Um, and that's one of the, the reasons why I would suggest using them. Now, this adverse party concept can allow for the potential toggling off of the trust from a disregarded grantor trust to a trust that pays its own taxes, a, a complex trust. Now, we, if you have an adverse party who has to approve distributions made from the trust to or for the benefit of the spouse, that is one way to keep the spouse as a beneficiary and potentially no, have the trust no longer be considered as a grantor trust for federal income tax purposes. Another question is, will the spouse's power of appointment be limited to lifetime, exercisable on death? Or, or will there be other limitations? Do we need approval of a third party? This is a, a number of things that can be considered in drafting this trust. It's almost like a blank canvas in a lot of respects. Asset protection jurisdictions, we've talked about that and we'll get to it later. Um, will trust protectors be appointed to change beneficiaries? That is a very important thing that I would suggest incorporating, as I said. And then we also have language in our trust that typically allow for um, you know, ch children to, to have to sign marital agreements, otherwise they'll be receiving much reduced distributions from the trust. So that's, that's an important provision to consider as well. Then we have the idea of will distributions be reduced after death based upon amounts that are reduced or limited, excuse me, to uh, the consumer price index adjustments. 
uh, you know, $10,000 a month until they're a certain age, $15,000 a month if they exceed a certain age, and so forth. And then finally, do we want to include charity as potential beneficiaries, right? This is one way to address that. This is something that can be very important for the charitably inclined beneficiary. Or maybe if, if a, benef a client doesn't want to have charity benefit ostensibly, but have their powers of appointment for the beneficiaries, allow them to appoint assets to or for the benefit of charity. All right, very, another flexible tool that can be used down the road. So the things that I just mentioned, I'm not gonna go over them in a lot of detail, but here on the forthcoming slides, we have a lot of language that can be used to uh, affect these items. And here on slide 42, we, we have a situation where, you know, the grantor can remove the trustee and appoint a, a person who's not related or subordinate to him as a trustee. Uh, we use the term eligible person here, as you can see here. That's one way to address the flexibility, but maybe naming the spouse as a trustee of the outset of, of the trust. Um, you know, we, we also have this idea that the grantor spouse, the beneficiary spouse, could appoint or affect the trusteeship after death if the uh if the or after the grantor is unable to do so so we we talked earlier about using the hem standard as a, a distribution standard for the spouse uh we have great language here to effectuate that and we also have language where the grantor spouse the beneficiary spouse can only receive distributions from the trust if the circumstances dictate that it's clearly necessary where the spouse does not have sufficient income or resources to satisfy his or her reasonable needs. And that's important because if you're going to split the gift with the, the beneficiary spouse, the, there is authority that says you can have a gift to a slat where you split the gift, but only if circumstances show that the beneficiary spouse will not reach those trust assets or need those trust assets unless it's clearly necessary where the spouse does not have sufficient income or other resources. So important to, to get to that. Here's our contingent marital deduction clause that if I make a gift to a trust for my wife uh, to a slat, and if I am worried about using more than my exclusion, uh, of course, I'm referring to myself, I'd wake up <laughs> because I'd be dreaming if I were ever forming a slat with that much money. <laughs> but this type of provision allows for uh, the gift tax savings potentially uh, by having a contingent marital deduction trust established. But I will tell you, don't use a Q-tip trust because if you use a Q-tip trust, there, there's you know a certain time period during which an election needs to be made, whereas this general power of appointment trust is a trust that uh, would kick in even if the IRS doesn't come back until two and a half years after a gift tax return is filed. And this language continues on all the way through to page 49. Now, the trust we talked about it being disregarded for federal income tax purposes. Uh, you know, this is very crucial here, but if you want to toggle off, you can have that adverse party language that I talked about. And here it is on slide 50, the bold language at the bottom. You know, and this is our typical health, education, maintenance, and support distribution standard. Uh, be careful to not have, you know, reasonable comfort. Uh, or, or excuse me, anything more than reasonable comfort. And I believe this language comes right out of the Internal Revenue Code reg or the Treasury Regulations for Internal Revenue Code Section 2041, which is a good way to read about HEMS if you ever uh, have a problem falling asleep or if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, very straightforward. So here's the, the gift splitting. Here are the authorities we talked about. That clearly necessary uh, threshold is important. There's a really nice article written by Bill Swindle back in 2007 that explores the, the, the uh, nuances of this area, important to, to consider. All right, so I mentioned earlier this idea of making sure that the grantor spouse takes his assets or her assets and funds the slat with them. So in my example, I wouldn't want Sophia to give me her assets and then have me fund the trust for her unless there's a strong period of time where I bear the economic risk of those assets before I fund that slat. We like to have language in our trust which says any contributions made to the trust which are deemed to be made by the beneficiary spouse will go into a separate trust and benefit only descendants. Um, that can help uh, 
get around those potential concerns of having the grantor spouse uh, being being considered as the grantor, both for estate tax and creditor protection benefits. So it's very important to, to consider that as well. We talked about limited powers of appointment. Here's our sample language. I don't think it's worth me jumping into it word by word. And then our divorce clause. You know, this is a very key component to representation of spouses. We typically have spouses sign a form that looks very similar to this one here. Uh, and we also, you know, go over the potential impact of control over trusteeship. Most of the time, we have this, the trust split into two and we have the spouses uh, each have the ability or authority to replace the trustee over 50% of these, the separate assets, a separate trust, excuse me. So if Sophia and I were divorced, if she finally had enough of me and we set up this trust slot for her benefit uh, that also benefits our descendants, she has a trust with 50% of her assets, uh, excuse me, 50% of the assets in the slat after our divorce. She can affect the trusteeship as to that 50%. And I can affect the trusteeship as to the other 50%. And that way it's 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 a little more equitable. I'll probably be disgruntled because I can't reach the assets of the 50%. But let's say that in my fictional universe, I came to the marriage with all the money. I have all these assets. I'm the wealthier spouse. I'm concerned about Sophia's faithfulness and her potential ability to, to, to remain my spouse in a good marriage. I go to my lawyer and I say, I want to draft this trust for the benefit of my wife, but I don't want her to be a beneficiary if she passes, if she divorces me. Well, we have language we can use for that. And we've typically implemented this on that similar scenario where you have a spouse with a lot of a lot more assets than the other, particularly if it's a uh, second marriage and there's some concern that you know the, the spouse may be in it more for the money than otherwise. But you know, food for thought uh, in considering the drafting of these trusts. And of course, we have more detail on that language. Now, when doing the SLAT, there's this concept of, you know, do, is it funded with marital assets or separate assets? What I just talked about, having this elimination clause for the beneficiary spouse, that's typically used in a separate property SLAT, right? Wealthy spouse comes to the marriage with assets, wealthy spouse. Uh, sets up the trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse and I'm sorry of the the other spouse and wants to uh, make sure that those assets remain separate assets. Well, if assets are appointed with or, 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 or their marital assets fund the slat, you know we typically would use more of that 50% each over the trusteeship and maybe have the 50% that I could access be moved to an asset protection jurisdiction where I can be added as a beneficiary of the trust, All right? That's another way to address this. So, you know, potentially have good care over forming these trusts and what assets are going into them. But if there is marital assets that go into the trust, you know, consider having that held in a separate asset, a separate trust that, um, you know, is used for Maybe that's for, for the spouse exclusively prior to separate assets being expended for the benefit of the, the beneficiary spouse. Uh, so I'm going to skip along here. Now, the floating spouse provision, we have uh, an example of that, that clause here on slide 67. And let us get now to the dreaded 682 issue, the section 682 issue. So before the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017, uh, in our example here, where Sophia has finally had enough of me and has left and divorced me, if I set up a slab for her benefit and she does so with the divorce, then under the pre-2017 law, the trust would no longer be considered as a grantor trust, meaning that I don't have to pay the taxes on that trust, assuming I toggle off grantor trust status otherwise. However, she will under the new law, she will be considered as my spouse even though we are no longer married, meaning that the repeal of Section 682 causes me to pay the income taxes on this trust for my ex-wife's benefit. I'm not going to be very happy about that if a divorce were to happen. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of guidance out there about how this is addressed uh, because of the technical wording in the 
in the Section 672 regulations and in Section 672 itself, uh, it's very difficult to, to really come up with a solution where we would get back to the pre six eight pre section uh repeal of section 682 in 2017 so how do we address this issue well number one we provide for elimination of the, ben the beneficiary spouse on divorce may not be practical if the slat is funded with marital assets but nevertheless it, it does avoid the issue potentially we think it does at least number two have an adverse party have to consent to distributions to the spouse it might avoid the 682 issue but it's not clear but any distributions that are actually made to the beneficiary spouse uh, would be taxable the income would be taxable to the grantor if income is used to satisfy such distributions finally the most likely solution here is having a marital agreement uh, for the spouses as to who pays the income tax associated with the trust income in the event of, the, of a divorce so a an agreement where the spouses say look if we divorce and i have to pay the income taxes on your on this trust for your benefit you're gonna have to repay me every year an amount of that tax the tax rate for a certain amount of time or you're gonna have to give me a concession which is the likely tax that's going to be uh earned or accrued under the trust over the course of years following divorce very difficult not to deal with but I think one of these solutions potentially could untie that knot. So I would I would suggest considering it. And here is some sample language for said marital agreement that I discussed. Uh, it's worthy of consideration, no question. Okay, so then we have this idea of making sure that the assets are protected uh, from the beneficiaries, creditors. You know, it's not only important to understand the law of situs of the uh, of the trust, but also the law where the beneficiary resides, because Maybe that beneficiary's law state allows for trusts to be attached if administration occurs in that state. You know, we, we might want to have a Cuba clause or a fee, fleet clause in the trust where the assets can be moved to an offshore trust or to a uh, potential asset protection jurisdiction. So it's worthy of, of, of consideration as well. And in setting up these types of trusts, it's always the thought of what types of creditors can reach in to, to the trust, right? Number one, in the jurisdiction of CITES, are there exception creditors? Florida has some exception creditors. We have, you know, federal government, if, if authorized by statute, can reach into a slat. Uh, a lawyer or someone else who helps a beneficiary or grantor set up a, a trust, set up an irrevocable trust, uh, they can reach in to get their bills paid. Uh, in Florida, as a source of last resort for child support and alimony. Those are big plans, those are big exceptions to creditors. If a creditor of a contributing spouse can reach into the trust, then, you know, from a state tax standing, planning standpoint, those assets are probably going to be included in the grantor's estate. So it's important to, to kind of understand the import, the, uh, the role and, and the implications of setting up a trust in a particular jurisdiction. So, you know, if you have a certain type of slat established here in florida or north carolina or south carolina for example that allows for that quote unquote boomerang slat where you know i set up that trust for sophia i can be a beneficiary after her death and state law considers me as the beneficiary not as a grantor it considers sophia to be the the grantor of that trust for my benefit well there are some potential issues that could come up uh, because it's not really clear from an estate tax standpoint whether the IRS will consider me as the grantor or Sophia as the grantor. If she is not going to, or if the assets are not included in her estate for federal estate tax purposes, I probably will be considered as the grantor. So it's worthy of, of consideration there. Uh, maybe having trust protectors move the trust to an asset protection jurisdiction. And here on slide 74, we have some of the implications of using maybe an Alaska or Nevada trust or something a little more exotic or offshore such as nevis or belize or the isle of man so you know worth worth mentioning here i'm not going to go over every word but these are very important resources to, to consult uh when considering whether to go offshore or stay in in state now a new topic relatively new topic that has been pretty important to a lot of people is is upstream planning 
And the whole concept is making sure that the grantor uh, the, or the assets the grantor puts in the trust potentially could get a new income tax basis by inviting estate tax inclusion in a beneficiary's estate for estate tax purposes. Here's an example. In our fictional slat that we've been talking about that I set up for Sophia and, and our, our kids, uh, let's say I include my 91-year-old grandmother as an income beneficiary of that trust. And I say, Grandma, I'm going to give you the power to appoint assets in this trust to the creditors of your estate up to your remaining exemption, not to exceed $12,920,000 less all of the assets you have, less $1,000. And you have to exercise that power. You have to get the consent of Ken Crotty, my law partner, Alan Gaston, my law partner, uh, and Brandon Ketcher, my other law partner. Three of them have to agree. They're independent parties. They're not beneficiaries of the trust. By doing that, it allows for the assets to be included in my grandmother's estate. She has a relatively modest estate. Therefore, the assets in that trust can get a new basis, right? They get a full step up in basis depending on what assets are in there, but most of them will under section 1014 of the Internal Revenue Code. And that allows my children and Sophia as well to have a new basis uh, on, on assets that are held under the trust can be a tremendous income tax savings if, if it's structured appropriately. Now you can amend trust to include this. You can have, you know, for a grantor who maybe set up a slat years ago when the exemption was, you know, $2 million or something, and now doesn't worry about the estate tax, unwind the previous transaction. Have the grantor added as a beneficiary to get this step up in basis. It's an important tool. And here's some language we've used to, garner that step up in basis by giving a general power of appointment uh, to uh, you know, a beneficiary under the trust. Um, and, and this is the exact language here on, on slide 80. This has become more and more common as we get towards the sunsetting of the high exemption levels. And you know, there's a lot of uh, clients out there that maybe, or, or have family members that don't need this high exemption. Um, I, I'm telling you, you know, my, my, my clients who contact me for this, or, or for, for tax planning, I would say maybe a third of the time, this is something that's on the forefront of their radar, and I'm surprised it's not higher. I think it's a very important tool. It can be very, very helpful. Uh, so here's some more assets on the step up and basis. And you know we have some uh, slides here going into this, giving this power of appointment to a grandparent. I'm not gonna go into detail, but this is a, allows effectively to have the, the assets held in a manner uh, that gets that power of appointment, but you can safeguard it, as I said, by having independent parties who may be reluctant to give consent, like Alan, Ken, and Brandon, uh, have to approve the exercise of the power of appointment so that my grandmother doesn't meet a, a young swindler who woos her uh, at, at a nursing home or otherwise and tries to take advantage of her. You know, that, that's a really important tool to help protect the assets in the family. Now let's not forget charitable distributions, right? We mentioned earlier using charitable distributions from the trust uh, as, as a possible way to you know, benefit charity, but hey, it's also got a great income tax planning technique uh, involved as well, where you can have the trust set up potentially a charitable remainder trust or have distributions go outright from the trust and receive a charitable deduction. Now, if the trust happens to be a complex trust down the road, you can use the Section 642C charitable deduction that uh, that is available under the Internal Revenue Code to uh, allow for distributions to qualify for the charitable deduction. However, make sure that the trust specifically authorizes distributions to charity, because if it doesn't, there isn't going to be a charitable deduction, because the way that 642C reads, the governing instrument must uh, allow for or authorize the trustee to make distributions to charity. You know, we like that to have this clause in here as a just in case, because you never know down the road when you want to use charitable planning for income tax or otherwise uh, purposes. And here's some language that we would typically use in that, uh, that type of trust. So trust protectors, I banged on this drum repeatedly throughout the presentation. We love to use them because you never know what's going to happen down the road. 
client may set up a, a slat right now for the benefit of spouse and three children. And potentially later on, client says, you know what? Child A isn't worthy of, of having an equal share. They, they are having substance abuse problems or maybe the other side of the coin. Child A is so wealthy, I don't want child A to benefit from here. Well, trust protectors can make those changes. They can move the situs of a trust. They can replace the trustee. They can potentially add back a grantor as a beneficiary of the trust. And that's one of the more important things to consider. Um, I'm thinking that the, the, the best way to do so, or we're thinking that, I guess, uh, is, is to have an independent party like trust protectors add back the grantor as a beneficiary only if the grantor meets certain criteria. And we talked about if the grantor's net worth drops down to an independently significant level. And in this case, just to make it extra camouflaged, we say that a permissible beneficiary must be a descendant of the mother of the grantor and cannot include someone who qualifies as an independent trustee from a net worth standpoint. And we go to the next slide. In this instance, we define independent trustee as any individual who's not an attorney uh, must have uh, a net worth of at least $6 million or more. So in essence, going back to this provision, the grantor must have a net worth of at least $6 million, sorry, below $6 million to be added as a beneficiary. And if the grantor is worth $30 million, well, then that's a pretty significant dip, right? The grantor is not going to give assets away or reduce her net worth or his net worth to that point in order to become a beneficiary of this trust. And that independent significance option is kind of what keeps the IRS at bay from having these uh, types of trusts being considered as owned by the grantor for federal estate tax purposes. Now, of course, the whole genesis of this comes from a PLR that was issued in 2009 that said those facts by itself don't necessarily cause a, a, a grantor being a beneficiary of the trust of a slat, uh, being uh, having the assets being included in the grantor's estate for federal estate tax purposes. Another way to, to use uh, a slide here is the inter vivos Q-tip. Now a Q-tip trust is a marital deduction trust. So if I make a gift to an inter vivos Q-tip for Sophia, uh, that's not gonna use my exclusion, right? But she can disclaim what I give to that trust so that the assets pass into a trust system for the benefit of our descendants or maybe into a trust system that is no longer a Q-tip that's considered to be gifted. Now, the next facet of our presentation here kind of gets into this concept of using trust where the grantor could be added as a beneficiary, where the grantor can become a beneficiary of a SLAT. And that's a very important tool, as I mentioned, and I've kind of talked about ways to go about this. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's more important to have that independent significant item in place such as if the grantor is financially destitute or if the grantor is, has divorced divorce is a pretty independently significant item uh, that's a, a conservative way to provide that the contributor can be a beneficiary if you go to an asset protection jurisdiction uh, you know if it's a non-asset protection jurisdiction who knows right i formed that trust for sophia we live in florida we put our Florida real estate in there, our Florida bank accounts and brokerage accounts, investment accounts, and we we set it up as a Nevada trust with a Nevada trustee. Uh, well, if I get a judgment against me here in Florida, will a Florida judge decline, or will a Nevada judge, I should say, respect that? Or will the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution require that my uh, Florida judgment can be used to satisfy, can be or can be satisfied by assets of this Nevada trust. There is not a case out there on this. It is a concern, a valid concern for planners when setting up these types of trusts. Uh, there are additional safeguards. Not having a grantor spouse added as a beneficiary unless a beneficiary exercises a power of appointment. Uh, that's a pretty good technique. Something called a splat. Uh, that that is, is very commonly used where you give the spouse a limited power of appointment, the power to appoint assets to anyone they want, well, they can exercise that in favor of the grantor spouse. And by doing so, potentially 
uh, could have an additional safeguard in place. Again, not 100% certain what, that this would be respected, but it's certainly worth consideration. Um, and, and again, this is some slides here on the independent significance doctrine. There's a lot of case law here. It has to be something that is, you know, not incidental or collateral, but it has to be kind of a, a pretty strong and monumental impact of the adoption of children, divorce, becoming destitute or having their, their net worth reduced significantly. Very much uh, an important item. It's not to be taken lightly. So um, just going to continue to go down the slides here and going to go to this PLR that we talked about, 2009-44-002. This is a concept that, you know, this is the, the ruling that was the genesis of this type of planning where you have a grantor spouse who could be a beneficiary of the trust. Now, in recent years, we have this new rule here in Florida, a change to the Florida statute that uh, is also commonplace in states like North Carolina and South Carolina and others, where the grantor spouse can be a beneficiary, but only after the death of the first dying of the beneficiary spouse. Uh, in, in Florida, the irrevocable trust mustn't provide for the, the grantor spouse to be a beneficiary during the uh, the over life or the life of the of the first of the beneficiary spouse. Um, if if that's the case, so if I set that slap for Sophia and I'm a beneficiary after her death, but not before then, Florida law will treat her as the set law and not me. And you know you'll see how th this is kind of a unique rule because it it has to be a complete gift trust. It can't be an incomplete gift trust. It can't be a trust that's set up where you know, I as the grantor would have the power to change beneficiaries by exercising a power of appointment, um, which can be common from a creditor protection standpoint. It has to be a complete gift trust. And the biggest trap is that it can't benefit me as the grantor during my wife's lifetime, right? A big trap here is if you draft this trust to say that the surviving spouse can't, uh, or, or excuse me, that the grantor spouse will become a beneficiary after the divorce of the spouses. That's not going to work. And that's going to cause the grantor spouse to nevertheless be considered as the grantor of the trust, which means that the grantor's creditors can reach into the trust and um, access the assets. Now, there are other states that, that have statutes here. And here's the North Carolina statute. It's kind of similar here. Uh, in that there's that lifetime prohibition. South Carolina is a little bit different here. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not one, I don't believe there's a lifetime requirement in, in place. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit broader. So it's worthy of consideration, but do not, I'm gonna repeat this because it's so important, do not provide that the grantor spouse will be added as a beneficiary in the event of divorce. It's only on the death of the original spouse. And also be weary of the potential estate tax issues that could arise from this kind of arrangement because it's not necessarily clear uh, in, in drafting this type of arrangement. Uh, finally, the last thing I want to touch on is the incomplete gift slat. I teased it a minute ago. This is a slat where, for example, I would set up a Nevada trust uh, with a Nevada trustee and I would contribute assets to it but it would not be considered as a taxable gift because I would retain the right to change the beneficiaries on my death and also the power to appoint, uh, at, excuse me, the power to veto distributions during my lifetime. Those powers cause the transfers to the trust to not be completed gifts for federal gift tax purposes. But the fact that the assets are in trust and my rights to affect this do not include the ability to add myself as a beneficiary can provide asset protection benefits that you wouldn't otherwise find, um, you know, in, in, in some clients or in high risk professions like doctors or, uh, you know, other, other professions where they're worried about creditor issues or other situations where they're worried about creditor issues. This is a really neat tool that can be used for creditor protection planning uh, that's not necessarily obvious at first blush. So I, I hope that you enjoyed our talk today. I, I'm sorry if I went on in the substance a little more and didn't pepper us with more jokes. 
Rest assured, Alan will be back next week on uh, June 3rd. Thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it. I hope that the rest of your, your weekend is fantastic. It's a long weekend, this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and, and I, again, appreciate your attendance and your continuing interest in our programs.